Tina, but we were talking about it with Miss Harrison, and I, I loved it. I loved everything about it. Uh, I will tell you what happened here, um, just straight from the horse's mouth. This was, so as of tomorrow, it would have been a month ago or three weeks ago? Three weeks. Three weeks is somewhere. I don't know. I'm so medicated right now. I have no clue. <laughs> I've had church members come up to me and say, you must be in so much pain while you preach because we know you wouldn't take painkillers while you're preaching. I'm like, no. <laughs> of course not, no. Absolutely not. And then uh, they were saying, man, your, your messages have just been so much more colorful. Well, yeah. It, it helps when you can hear colors and see sounds. Uh, in your uh, in your messages. Anyways, where was I? Oh, highly medicated. Yeah, uh, my foot. So three three weeks ago, my wife and I are supposed to be going on vacation, just a little staycation in the area. We had my kids being watched by mom and dad and all that fun stuff, and we were ready to go. And I have a big stump in my backyard. Don't talk to me about stump removal. I I I get it all. I had all the different ideas. I was either going to grind it down or I was going to drill into it and pour diesel in it, just slowly burn it, or I was going to carve it into the shape of a Confederate general and hope the liberals would just come and <laughs> take it down on their own. But I I wanted a way to to exercise as well. As you can tell, I'm very much into exercise and weightlifting and thank you for laughing. Very very much appreciate that. Um, so I said, "Hun, I'm going to I'm going to Lowe's and I'm going to get an axe." And she's like, "Okay." So I go and I get an axe and it has the the little rubber cover on it because it's very sharp. And um, I get home and I start whacking away at this stump. Yes, I know it wasn't going to do anything. It, I, I get it. I get it. Okay. I've I've heard all the speeches. <sighs> Bad idea. All right. So. Um, you know, the first one goes in, thwump, and that feels really good. And then the next one comes in, thwump, and feels real good. And on my last, on my last one, the dog came too close. And uh, so I got distracted by the dog. And what I wanted to do was thwump, but it didn't thwump, it kapwang. So I came, I came down too steep, and it, and, it, and it just glanced off, and it hit my foot. Now, you, you know how when you're, when you're chopping something in the kitchen and, and if it ever catches you, you, you feel it, you know? I didn't feel it. I didn't, I didn't feel it at all. It just, felt like, it just felt like something hit my foot. So I'm yelling at the dog with the ax, you know, over here. And then I go to swing again. I'm like, I should probably look at my foot. And I look down and my shoe's open. My shoe was just cut open. So I, I flip off the shoe and my sock is open. And... <laughs> My foot is open. So severed both arteries, nerves, tendons, straight through the bone. Just shoot. Straight through the bone. And then amputation got thrown out. And surgery the next day, coming out of anesthesia, was very interesting. You could ask my wife about that. I was extremely flirtatious, apparently, um, with her first but then I moved on. I was not planted. Um, I moved on. I was very, very <clears throat> cavalier. Um, so anyways, I'm just so thankful to be here today. Thank you for your prayers. My foot feels great. I wish I could get rid of the boot. It's just, it, it's, it's, it's so annoying, but it's, it's okay. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I want to be a help to you this morning with something that I am dealing with in my church. Don't know if you're dealing with it here, but then I said that in the last hour, and apparently you might be. So uh, this one, I want to preach to you about something that I've been counseling a lot of people with. I've been counseling with people about this, really, the eight years that I've been down there, four years as youth pastor, and now four years as pastor. I want to, I want to talk to you about this matter of eternal security, okay? Not a lot of people believe in eternal security. There are entire denominations that do not believe in eternal security. What do I mean by that? Once you are saved, you are always saved. Amen. When you are saved, you can never lose your salvation. Amen. And, and somebody was talking to me two weeks ago about it. I believe that you can. All right, what sin does it? Yeah. Well, well, no, no, no. If I can lose my salvation, I want to know what sin does it. 
what sin makes me lose my salvation? Because if it's any sin, I am spending the rest of my life every single day praying for the Lord to save me. Because I sin constantly. Don't look at me all pious. You do too. You do too. You're acting like you don't. You do. If, if I never wanted to sin with my tongue again, I'd just cut it out, right? If I'd never want to sin with this, I'd, I'd cut them off. Oh, too soon. Too soon. But how, you can't stop this, right? You can't stop this. This just, this just goes and goes and goes. And the Bible says even the thought of foolishness is sin. So if you can lose your salvation, which one does it? And then you got to get saved again. you got to get baptized again and, and, and all this stuff. So what does the Bible have to say about it? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the Baptists say. And it doesn't matter what the Presbyterians and the Catholics and the Lutherans and the Methodists, it doesn't matter what they say. What matters is what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? And when we get away from the Bible, we get ourselves in trouble. So let's see what the Bible says. Let's see what Jesus says about it. John chapter 10, I invite you to stand out of respect for God's word. We stand for what we respect. John chapter 10. <coughs> Love, I left my water down there. I think it's in between. Oh, oh, there, there it is. Thank you. I don't like drinking in front of people. It makes you feel all parched and stuff, but. You can take a pain pill right now. I already did. I already did. We're good. We're good. John chapter 10, verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Stop. Spiritual place, right? Let's say it this way. Religious place filled with religious people doing religious stuff and talking about religious subjects. Right? Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt if thou be the Christ? Tell us plainly. Which is just a ridiculous statement when you see all that Jesus has done already. Jesus answered them, I told you. And ye believed not. You see that? You believe not. So you're asking me to prove by my words that I am who I say that I am. I've already told you and you believe not. But now let's talk about the works. The works that I do. Where am I at? I shouldn't have taken my glasses off. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but ye believe not. No matter what I say, you don't believe. No matter what I do, you don't believe. And notice his reasoning. You believe not because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, and this is a callback to what he had, uh, a lecture he had given earlier, a sermon he had given earlier in, the, in this chapter. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Colon, right? Colon. Continuation of thought. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Obvious re reference to the Trinity, right? Yeah. But now they're, two in, they're two in person. Well, well, the Trinity is three in person, but if we're talking about the Father and the Son, two in person, but one in essence. What Jesus is saying here, as far as your eternal security is concerned, as far as your soul is concerned, my Father and I are on the same page about this one. When you are saved, you are always saved. Amen. We'll go ahead and pray. I have three goals in my message. I'll tell, them, I'll tell them to you after I pray. My Lord, my Father in heaven, I ask that you would be with the preaching of your word as you have already been with the reading of it and the singing, the fellowship that we have had. Bless this church. Watch over the souls here who do not know for sure that they're going to heaven. Would you convict them of their need for a Savior? Show them that they are a sinner, and if they die in that sin, they will go to hell. But then, Lord, encourage those who are saved and who have maybe been struggling with doubt. Bring them closer to you today than when they came in. We ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing for so long. But, you know, you read the New Testament. When Jesus preached, he sat and all the people stood. Hey, that's a good idea. No? No, some of you are shaking your head. Okay. Three goals in my message. 
My first goal is to challenge you to ask yourself, do I believe in Jesus Christ? Do I believe that he is who he says he is? Just a little warning here, a lot of the Jesus that you find on Facebook and social media and in a lot of these churches today is not the Jesus of the Bible. Do you believe he is who he says he is? Do you believe in what he did? Do you believe in his gospel? Do you believe that he died and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures? Do you believe that? And if you believe that, you have to ask yourself, wait a second, why did he die? Because he never sinned, right? He never sinned. He was the perfect son of God. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So if the wages of sin is death, and yet he never sinned, why did he die? He must have had to die for somebody else. He must have had to die on somebody else's account, yours and mine. Do you believe that? Do you believe that what he did was for you? Do you believe that what he did was for your sin? And then, the, I mean, there's so many different questions that we can ask ourselves here. Why, why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus die if you could get to heaven on your own? Anybody? Anybody want to want to answer that? Why would he do that if you could get to heaven on your own? Because I'm pretty sure Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift. We're going to see that today. It is the gift of God, not of works. Why? Lest any man should boast. Could you imagine going to heaven? How did you get here, sir? I got here because Jesus Christ is my Savior. He died for me, and he rose again for me, and I asked him to save me, and he saved me. How did you get here? I got here on my own. I didn't need Jesus. Come on. Why would he do what he did If you could get to heaven on your own, here's another question. Why would he do what you did, what he did, if you couldn't know for sure? Why would he do that? When he when he healed blinded eyes, did they need these? No, they had 20/20 vision all the way. When he healed lame legs, did they go away limping or leaping? He did all things well. When he died on the cross, he said this: "It is finished." Do you believe in this story? Do you believe that what Jesus did and who he was was because of you? Do you believe in Jesus plus nothing? It's not Jesus plus baptism. We're Baptists, right? We're Baptists. We're we're proud to be Baptists. Well, pride is a sin. We're glad to be Baptists. There's a reason that we're Baptists. But baptism isn't a part of salvation. Baptism is necessary for obedience, but not necessary for salvation. When you add baptism to Jesus, you're telling Jesus you're not enough. Whenever you add to Jesus, you're telling him he's not enough. Or do you believe in Jesus plus plus nothing, minus nothing? Because when you take away from Jesus, you're saying you're too much. You're too much. You're asking too much. Which my Bible says that even if we put down our lives as a living sacrifice, that's reasonable. But how many people do you know look at Jesus and what he requires of his disciples and say, no, I'm not going to do that. And they start taking away. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Plus nothing, minus nothing. If you believe, my second goal is to encourage you with, I think, one of the most wonderful truths that Jesus ever taught in the Bible. If you don't believe, oh, before we go on. If, until you understand this truth, you are going to struggle in your relationship with God. Until you understand this truth, you are going to struggle in your life of faith. You will struggle, you will struggle, you will struggle, you will not grow. I'm still dealing with people in my church who have not gotten this down and they're handicapped in their growth. If you don't believe, my goal is for this day to be your day of belief. By encouraging you and showing you the blessings that will be yours the moment that you believe in Jesus Christ. 
The moment you believe in Jesus Christ, everything that we just read about in verse 28 through 30 applies to you. The moment you believe. If you don't believe in Jesus, you may as well cut those verses out of your Bible because they don't apply to you. They only apply to his sheep. And he said, my sheep believe. If you don't believe, you are not my sheep. 28 through 30 of chapter 10 does not apply to you. You may as well go ahead and cut it out. And don't tell me, well, I work. He didn't say my sheep work. He didn't say you're not my sheep because you work not. Because you go to church not. Because you read the Bible not. Because you don't get baptized. Because ye believe not. Ye are not one of my sheep. And my sheep hear my voice. And his voice said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. His voice said, God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him, not worketh, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you don't believe, you're like the Jews in verse 24 through 26. And Jesus makes it clear, it's only when you believe that you become one of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. Do you believe? If you do believe, I wouldn't be surprised that many of you had cut out John chapter 10, verse 28 through 30, because how many people who believe act. Did that make sense? It made sense in here. So be, be, I, I, wit I, I observe believers who live their life in fear, who live their life in retreat, they live their life in doubt, they live their life in worry. And there's no need to do that when you believe in Jesus Christ. Why are you going to live your life in fear when John chapter 10, verse 28 through 30 is in your Bible? Why are you going to live your life in worry even if the greatest storms come about you when John chapter 10, verse 28 through 30 is in your Bible? Unless you cut it out. Why are you going to live in doubt when John chapter 10, verse 28 through 30 is in your Bible? Why are you going to live your life in wavering to and fro? Am, am I his child? Am I not his child? John chapter 10, verse 28 through 30 tells me, even if the devil himself dangled my soul over hell, I had nothing to worry about. I have nothing to worry about. Because Jesus promises something in these verses that apply to me. Because I believe. If you believe... I want you to consider the words that Jesus gives us in these verses here. Because I'm telling you, I'm struggling with it. I'm struggling with people in my church who do not know that they know that they know that they're going to heaven when they die. And you ask them, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus? Yes. So what's the problem? What, what's the issue here? You either believe or you don't believe. Right. Well, I just don't know. if. And they start giving me all, oh, okay, I'm really getting ahead of myself. We'll get there. We'll get there. Listen to what Jesus says. In these verses, are you ready? And I give unto them eternal life. Stop. He does not say, and they earn from me. He does not say, and they purchase from me. He doesn't say, and they borrow from me. They bargain from me. They trade with me. I give unto them eternal life. So then religion steps in. Good old religion, right? Religion steps in and asks, how can Jesus give away something so precious? How can he give away something so amazing? How can he give away something so valuable as eternal life? If you were to drive down, what's this road right here? State Street. If you were to drive down State Street and right around this little bend, you see somebody standing on the side of the road with a brand new Tesla. And it says, free. What's your first question? What's the catch, dude? Right? What's the catch? Now, you'll pull over just out of curiosity. What's the catch? Nothing that good is for free. Right? Now, wait a second. Here's a better, here's a better question to ask the person, rather than what's the catch, is who paid for this? And if he said, I paid for it, 
I have the title. I just bought it with my own money. I have the title. And I'm giving it away for free. Hey, that changes everything. That changes everything. He can do with it what he pleases if he bought it. So if religion wants to ask, how can Jesus give away something as incredible as eternal life for free? Wait a second. It wasn't free. It wasn't free. He bought it. Are, are you following? Are you fo Maybe I should put my glasses on. I, I just see men as trees walking. Sometimes I get mad at my church. I'm like, you're not following. They're like, we promise. We're, we're, we're following. And I just take my glasses off. Okay. He bought it. And it cost him everything. It cost him his throne in glory. To come down and be born of a virgin in a manger and walk the dusty streets of Nazareth. It cost him the glory due to his name. He went from holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come, to coming down to the Pharisees, which, by the way, were very religious people, to going from holy, 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 coming down to Pharisees who look at him one point and said, we be not born of fornication. We know who our father is. Do you get what they're saying there? Yeah, this whole Mary born of a virgin story, we don't buy that. We know who our dad is. Our father is Abraham. He didn't have to put up with that, but he did. He gave up the comforts of deity to come down to earth to be hungry and thirsty and tired and despised and rejected. He gave up happiness to come here. The Bible says he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And it cost him his life. He was tortured. He was beaten. He was scourged, buried in a borrowed tomb, Rose again, right? Rose again. Let's not keep him in the tomb. He rose again, proving that he was who he says he was and, and completing the purchase of eternal life. When he rose again, the purchase of eternal life was completed. And church, now that he bought it, he can do whatever he wants with it. And he could have been fair with his purchase if he wanted to. He could have been fair with his purchase and said, I bought it. It's mine now. Now you need to buy it. He could have said that. That would have been fair. Now you need to buy it. You need to buy it by strapping a bomb to your chest and blowing yourself up. You need to buy it by giving this amount of money to the church. Sometimes we wish. Uh, never mind. Moving on. <laughs> you, need, you need to buy it by doing this and by doing this and sacrificing this and sacrificing that. He could have been fair with his purchase. He could have been mean with his purchase and said, it's mine. I'm not giving it to you. It's mine. You all have rejected me for millennia anyway. Why am I going to bring you in? He could have been mean with his purchase. He could have profited off his purchase. And he could have looked at different people and said, you know what, you have land, I want your land if you want my eternal life. You know what, you have money, I want your money if you, have, if you want to have eternal life. You know what, you have beauty, I want your beauty if, if, you have eter if you want to have eternal life. He could have done any of that. He could have profited from it. He could have hoarded it. He could have been selected with it. I'll give it to you, but not you. I'll give it to you, but not you. You, yes, 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 no, 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 yes, yes, no. I don't like you. No, no, yes, yes, no. Hey, it was his. It was his, right? It's his. He can do whatever he wants with it. He chose to be gracious with it and give it, give it, give it for free to anybody who will believe. It's his choice to do that. When you believe, Jesus said, I give, I give unto you eternal life. Now, it's already good, right? It's already good, but we're just getting started here. Notice all of the extreme language in these verses. He uses no moderate language, no middle-of-the-road language, no language that makes us say, what, is, what did he mean by that? No language that can be debated, no language that can be put up to secondary interpretation. Language like this. It, let's just walk through the verse. I give unto them eternal life. Eternal. You know what that means? Not temporal. Church, if you could lose it, if you could lose it, that's not eternal, right? If you could lose it, that's not eternal. Eternal, by definition, is forever, unending, infinite, everlasting. Now, we can't wrap our minds around eternity, can we? Has anybody tried? We, the, the choir sang 10,000 years will just be started. 10,000 10, years is nothing, nothing. I, I can tell you what eternity is not. You want me to help you with that? Imagine the Pacific Ocean. 
and replace every drop of water in the Pacific Ocean with a penny. And each penny is worth a trillion years with Jesus. And at the end of each trillion years, you need to turn in another penny. That's not eternity. Because it's going to run out one day. That illustration, it is even close to what eternity is. I give unto them eternal life. How about this one? They shall never perish. Under no circumstances. Not at all. At no time. Not in any way. No way, no how, no when. Ain't gonna happen. That's the original Greek. Did you know that? <laughs> how about this one? Neither shall any man. Do you see the extreme language here? Neither shall any man. Then a little later, my father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man. Neither shall any man. No man. Nobody, no matter how strong, no matter how deceitful, no matter how determined, no matter how rich, no matter how smart, no matter how influential, no matter how powerful, no matter how many, no man will be able to pluck them out of my hand. My father, I like this one, my father which is greater than all, higher than the highest, greater than the great, wiser than the wisest is the father. And you couple that extreme language with the promise, I give unto them eternal life. Couple that together and you have this incredible truth that Jesus says to his sheep. When you believe, it doesn't matter what may come your way. It doesn't matter what, who may try to change it. It doesn't matter what man may say. It doesn't matter what man may think. It doesn't matter how many devils attack you. It doesn't matter how many fears plague you. It doesn't matter how much sin infects you. It doesn't matter how many doubts invade you. It doesn't matter how many storms shake you. It doesn't matter how many enemies surround you. I've got you. I've got you. You are in my hand. When you believe, I've got you. You're in my hand. I just have a question. Are you in his hand? Well, I guess a better question is, do you believe? Do you believe? If you don't believe, you're unprotected. You're unprotected from the enemy. You must face the darts of the wicked by yourself without any protection. The Bible says you are taken captive by Satan at his will. But here's what this verse teaches me. These verses teach me. If you believe, let the enemy attack. Let the darts fly. And let the storms rage. He's got you. Amen. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them on my hand. Oh, men will try. Plenty of men will try. Religious men will try to pluck you out of his hand by telling you that you can lose your salvation, teaching you that you can lose your salvation. So then what does Jesus do? He looks at them and says, they shall never perish. Is that too simple? Hey, religious men who say you can lose your, you lose your salvation, Wait, wait, wait. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Yeah. Satanic men will come up and tell you you can lose your salvation. By, here, here's what they do. Some men try to pluck you out by telling you lies about the Bible. Other men try to pluck you out by telling you the truth about yourself. Because satanic men will try reminding you of your sins. Why would Jesus hold on to somebody as wicked as you? You know what Jesus says to them? They shall never perish. They, they, they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Oh, but the Catholics say, okay, let me know where, let me know where I lost you. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Oh, but do you hear what they did the other day? Okay, let me know where I lost you. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Oh, but I read this blog the other day on, let me know where I lost you. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. They'll try. Let him try. Let him try. He's got you, believer. He's got you, believer. He's got you, believer. No matter what man may say or do. It teaches me something else. If you believe, even when you can't feel his hand, he's got you. 
Sometimes our feelings are much more visible than facts. But our feelings are never stronger than facts. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Once you are placed in Jesus' hand, there is never a time when you're out of it. There's never a time you're out of it. It's not like he's standing there with his hand open and compromisers are falling off the edge left and right. And he's, oh, oh, oh. And all the true believers are huddled in the middle. <laughs> he's got you. He's got you. Even when, there, there might be times when you don't feel it and you might not feel it for a while. There might be some times when you don't see it. It requires faith, you know. There might be some times when you don't see it and you don't see it for a while. But John chapter 10, verse 28 through 30 is still in your Bible so you can know, not by feelings, but by fact and by faith, he's got you. Here's what else it teaches me. If you believe, then even when you go through the wildest storms, he's got you. Amen. So tell me, worried spouse, whose companion is lost and on their way to hell, do you find any comfort in the fact that as you go through that storm, Jesus has got you in his hand? Tell me, worried parents, who you're watching your child go wayward and walk away from the faith that you taught them. Do you not find any comfort that as you go through that, Jesus has got you in his hand? Tell me, tired man, you feel like a failure because you're working constantly, but you can't make ends meet. Do you find any comfort in the fact that while you're going through that, Jesus has got you in his hand? Tell me, lady, who's discouraged right now because of all the problems that are happening at home, do you find any comfort in the fact that Jesus has got you in his hand? Single mother, I've got some precious single mothers in my church. My goodness, they're my heroes. Brother Harrison, they're my heroes. Do you find any comfort in the fact because you feel so underqualified and so, so unable to raise children on your own, do you not feel any comfort that Jesus has you in his hand? Amen. Wounded one, lonely one, damaged couple, you're going through strife in your marriage. Caregiver, we have some caregivers in our church. It's difficult because you're always giving and pouring and pouring out of your cup and it feels like nobody pours back in. Do you find any comfort in the fact that Jesus has you in his hand as you go through that? If you believe, he's got you. If you don't believe, whatever storm you face, you face alone. You face it alone. But when you believe, you're in his hands. When you believe, you are his sheep. When you believe, whither shall you go from his spirit? Whither shall you flee from his presence? Ascend up into heaven, he's got you. Make your bed in hell, he's got you. Take the wings of the morning, dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. He's got you. David said, even there shall his right hand hold me and lead me. It teaches me this also. This is a big one. If you believe, even when you doubt, he's got you. You've got to get this, okay? You've got to get this. Even when you believe, even when you doubt, he's got you. I'm so glad Jesus didn't say this. He did not say, and I give unto them life, and they shall not perish as long as they hold on to me. Yeah. Salvation isn't about you holding on to Jesus. It's about Jesus holding on to you. Yeah, Amen. The song says, when I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path for my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. And he does. Yeah. I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Question, does any man apply to you? Does the term any man apply to you? I'd say so. And there are some of you, the seeds of doubt get planted in your mind and in your heart far too often. 
much more often than you'd like and you start asking yourself, am I really saved? Every invitation time is a dredged, is, is, is dread, dread, drudge, both, dredge. See, making up words, it's cool. You knew what I was talking about, it's cool. Medicated, woo! And you ask yourself, am I really saved? Am I really saved, am I really forgiven? Did I mean, here, here, did I mean what I said when I prayed? Did I pray the right words? Did I say the right thing? You know, Brother Harrison, I, I really don't like it when we have pastors come to our churches and they give their testimony and, and they, they make it seem like, oh, I was, I was walking down a dusty road and it was stormy and there were no birds and just darkness enveloped me like a cloak and then suddenly the, the, the heavens parted and doves were flying around and I fell on my knees and I said, Oh, Father, which made heaven and earth and all that therein is, I am a sinner and my sin is as black as a thousand midnights and I now confess them to you and I ask that you would come into my heart. And these people are like, I didn't do that. I just said, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Yeah, that'll do. That'll do. Do you, know how many, do you know how many people, if they had the testimony of the thief on the cross, would be told by our Baptist churches that they weren't saved? If, if we had somebody come and, and they said, I just, I met the Lord one day and I said, would you remember me when you come into my kingdom? No, 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 no. There's three things you have to know. One thing you have to do and you have to. And he just said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. It was good enough for Jesus. should be good enough for us. Amen. But people, get they run into doubt because I don't have their testimony. Or I have young kids who say, when I got saved, I didn't change. I didn't, I didn't see a change. Well, you grew up in church, kid. What's the worst thing you were doing? Just sticking your gum underneath the pew, probably? <laughs> you know, this 40-year-old who just came from the world and he's messed up in drugs and alcohol. He's on his fifth marriage. Yeah, I hope that I see a change in his life. But this kid who's growing up in church, I didn't see a change. Well, you, you might not. You're might not going to see a 180 because you already had a lot of things going on. And we start comparing things to other people. Could I have prayed a bread of prayer? Uh, I, I, and do you notice, do you notice a, a pattern here? I, I, I. Did I? Could I? Me, 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 me. I guarantee you if you are doubting, you're looking at all the things that you did and not what Jesus did for you. I guarantee you that. Eternal life isn't found in what you do. It's found in what Jesus did for you. People don't doubt their salvation. They doubt the Savior. And when you doubt the Savior, you insult the Savior. You're calling him a liar because he promised you when you believe you're in my hand and you ain't falling out. Ever. But even when you doubt, I'm telling you, even when you doubt, you know that the Bible says, if we believe not yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Amen. I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Even when you doubt, the stars will fall, the sun will burn out, the ocean will dry, dogs will meow, cats will bark, and rocks will float before Jesus ever lets you go. Paul said, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able. He is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Your soul does not find its eternal security in your ability to hold on to Jesus. It finds its eternal security in his promise to hold on to you. Amen. Now, here's the last one. If you believe, even though you sin still, He's got you. Now, Satan is the father of lies. Everything he says is a lie, even when he tells the truth, it's just to cover a lie. And there are many lies that he tells the believer. Here are his two most common. Lie number one, Jesus would never continue to hold on to a sinner like you. Why would a Savior so holy Hold on to a sinner so wicked. You think you're still saved after you just thought what you thought? 
Am I the only one who gets talked to like this by the, by, the, by the accuser of the brethren? You think you're still saved after you just did what you did? You think you're still saved after you just said what you said? And you just wished what you wished? And you just went to where you went? And you just withheld what you withheld? You think you're still saved when you've aborted your baby? You think you're still saved when you've cheated on your spouse? You think you're still saved when you've been out of church and you've run from the Lord? You think you're still saved? You think you're still in his hand? What would make you think you're still in his hand? Someone as bitter as you. Someone as depressed as you. Someone as unhappy and worthless and damaged as you. How could a Savior so righteous hold on to a sinner so evil? It's a persuasive lie, isn't it? It's a persuasive lie. Let me respond to this lie. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Watch this. Watch this. I give unto them eternal life. Here's you. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Right? My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Okay, so watch this here. The devil may provide a million compelling arguments that this could happen. But I want the devil to give me one, one compelling argument that the Father would let go of Jesus. Anybody? The devil can spend all the time that he wants telling me Jesus would let go of you and th throw you out because of what you just did. Can you bear with me just for a second here? Even if Jesus wanted to do that, the Father would have to let go of him first. Anybody want to give me a reason why that would happen? It will never happen. When you believe you're in Jesus' hand, he is in the Father's. Now, if that's not enough for you, I'll say this. Romans chapter 5, 8. Uh, 5 verse 8 says, But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't that he died for us when we were perfect and then we go off and sin and he thinks, well, you ruined that, didn't you? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Timothy says this, This is a faithful saying. It's not going to change. And worthy of all acceptation, you've got to accept this, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, right? Amen. So my question is this. If being a sinner is the reason Jesus grabs you in the first place, why would being a sinner be the reason he lets you go all of a sudden? Yeah. Yeah. Where's the common sense, right? So for Satan to say, Jesus would not continue to hold on to a sinner like you. It's a lie. Church, it's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. Yeah, right. Line number two that he says, if Jesus will never let you go, then just live however you want. Right? If Jesus will not, never let you go, and this is what the religious people say, right? If, if grace does much more abound, then what keeps us from doing wrong? You think it would be better to tell our church, if you sin, we're going to excommunicate you. I wish we could do that sometime. <laughs> if, if, if you sin, if you sin, you're going to hell. Don't, don't you think it would have us live better? Well, it, it's the same thing. If, if we never wanted to have a car accident again, rep replace the airbag with a machete just poking at people. <laughs> no one would drive over five miles an hour. No one would drive. But, but Satan's lie is, if, if he'll never let you go, just live however you want. Here's all I can tell you. When I think of how much my Jesus loves me, he died for me. He came down to earth for me. And he had me on his mind when he died. And he could have called 12 legions of angels, but he didn't because he thought of me. And when I think of how much my father loves me, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. When I think about that, I don't want to grieve him. I don't want to grieve him. I've got some kids in my church. They're troublemakers. 
And if their parents, if their mom and dad came up to me and said, Pastor, I need you to help me with this kid because he's not paying attention and he's not obeying. I have two different ways that I can do that. Which one do you think is going to work? Let's say I go up to one of them and say, son, if you disobey, your father's going to kill you. <laughs> he'll cut your head off and he'll kick you out of the house and he'll never let you back. Now, okay, you know what? That young man, first of all, is not going to buy it for one second. He's going to take that as an insult to his father. I know better than that. My father would not do that to me. Our earthly father, he knows. I wouldn't do that to you. And if he did believe it, he's going to grow up resenting and fearing that man. Or do I look at the kid and say, son, I want you to think about how much your father loves you. He wakes up before the dawn and he goes to work so that you could have clothes on your back and shoes on your feet. Amen. Food on your table and a roof over your head. Yes. And before he ever let anything happen to you, before he let a hair of your head fall, he would take a bullet for you over and over again. He would gladly give his life so that you might live. Yes, he Think of how much your father loves you. Do you want to hurt somebody who loves you that much? Mm -hmm. Of those two options, which ones do you think are going to resonate more with that child? The love of the father. Amen. So all I'll tell you is that if you take the grace of God, if you take your salvation and his forgiveness as a license to do whatever you want, the Bible hits you differently than it hits me. That's right. I don't understand you. Right. I do not want to grieve the one who loves me so much. Unfortunately, though, Unfortunately, being in Jesus' hand doesn't keep me from sinning. The flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These two are contrary, the one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. I delight after the law of God in the inward members, but there is another, mem there's another law within me warring against the law that's, that's in my mind. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. But if you believe, even though you sin still, he's got you. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So do you believe? If you don't believe, you'll die in your sin. You'll face God alone and no Savior, no Savior to plead your case. But if you believe, he's got you. Let the enemy attack, he's got you. Let the storms come. He's got you. Even when you doubt, he's got you. Even though you sin still, he's got you. Do you believe that he is who he says he is? Do you believe in what he did? That he died, he was buried, and then he rose again, and he did that all for you. If you don't, you may as well cut these verses out of your Bible. They don't apply to you. You are not in his hand. But to you which believe, I want you to keep this at the forefront of your mind and have this be the day where you stop struggling with doubt. Write it on the table of your heart. You're in his hand. You're in his hand. Amen. He's got you if you believe. Amen. Are you one of his sheep? If you say yes, yes, I know for sure for a Bible reason that I am going to heaven when I die. Don't raise your hand if you can't, but I want you to raise your hand. I know for sure I'm going to heaven. Raise your hand right now. God bless you. And put your hands down. I saw some that couldn't. I hope I didn't confuse you in any way, and I'm going to hand it over to him. But if you do not know that you're going to heaven when you die, today can be the day that you can trust in him. Amen. But it's got to be your decision. It's got to be your decision. God can always remake you, but he'll never make you. He'll never force you. And neither can we. If I could, I would. But I invite you this morning, as the pastor comes, I invite you to trust in Jesus today. Be put in his hand. You will never perish. Heavenly Father, we ask in your name and in your name alone that you would do a marvelous work right now. And that you would remove the seeds of doubt from those who have been struggling but also that you would convict even one sinner in here who does not know that they are going to heaven when they die. 
so that they can trust in you today. We ask this in your name. Amen. Let's keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please. Head bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you say, Pastor Johnny, I could not raise my hand a little while ago. I do not know that I'm saved, but I have a desire to be saved. Would you please pray for me? I will pray for you. I just need to know who to pray for. If that's you, would you put your hand up right now and slip it right back down? God bless you. I see that. I see that. God bless you. There's one. Is there another? I do not know that I'm going to heaven. Would you please pray for me? I won't call you out. I will not embarrass you. I promise. Swallow your pride. Don't go to hell for anybody or for any reason. Anybody else? I want to know that I am in his hand. Please pray for me. I'll pray for this one. Lord, this one that raised his hand, I ask that you please let nothing keep him from coming forward today and trusting in you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Pastor. That's about eyes closed. If you just listen just for a little bit, heads bowed, eyes closed. You know, it sounds simple, and it's because it is. But yet, most people in this world have not truly received Christ, believed, and have been born again. Now you ask, well, if it's so simple, then why? Well, there's several reasons. One reason is because people are trusting in themselves instead of trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ to save them. Others may be trusting in their religion, what their religion teaches them instead of what the Bible teaches. There's many reasons why, even though it's simple, people still are not truly saved. Now, if you're listening to my voice this morning, and you've never truly trusted Christ, believed on Him, received Him as your Lord and Savior, you need to do that. The purpose of this message was not to get a saved person to doubt. The purpose of this message is so that those of us that are saved will be encouraged by the fact that we can't be taken out of the Lord's hands. We're, our, our salvation is secure. But if you've never received Christ, if you're not sure, if you were to die, you'd go to heaven. You need to get that settled. And dear Christian, I'm talking about true Christians now. Stop doubting. Uh, uh, don't, don't listen to the lies of Satan. Uh, realize that we are in his hand. Now think about this now. If you don't work to get saved, you don't work to stay saved. Does that make sense? If you believe the Bible, you believe that you don't do good works for salvation. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. So if you don't work to get saved, why would you work to keep saved? And I love what he said. I'm glad he mentioned that just because we're eternally saved doesn't mean we have a license to live the way we want to live as a Christian. And I, I love the fact that he said we ought to serve the Lord and live for the Lord mainly because we love him and we appreciate what he's done for us. Paul said the love of Christ constraineth me. It was his love for the Lord that motivated him to do what he wanted to do, what he needed to do as a Christian. You know, we don't keep our salvation. God keeps our salvation. So if you are a, a, a if you're sheep, if you've truly trusted Christ, then be encouraged by your eternal security. You're, you're, and if you're not sheep, if, you know, you're either sheep or goat. I preached a message uh, a while back. My granddaughter, Claire, before she made a decision in her heart to receive Christ. I was preaching one night from John 10. I was talking about if you're saved, you're a sheep. If you're not saved, you're a goat. And she looked over at her mom and she said to her mom, she said, Mom, I'm a goat. She said, Weston's a sheep. I'm a goat. Because she knew that she had never truly received Christ as Savior. And then not too long after that, she made the decision to, to believe and receive Christ. You're either sheep or a goat. 
If you're a goat, you need to get saved. If you're sheep, then you need to be encouraged that you are in his hand and you have eternal life, not temporary life, eternal life. Amen? And it's been said this, when a, when a saved person doubts, they doubt what they did. When an unsaved person doubts, they doubt what Jesus did. You understand the difference? So important. This was an important message for us. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If the Lord spoke to your heart, maybe you need to just come, just say, Lord, I'm saved. I know it, but uh, I haven't been, I haven't, uh, I've grieved you, Lord. I, I haven't been the way, the, the kind of Christian I should be. And Lord, uh, help me to appreciate and love you like I should. Maybe you're here and you need to come and uh, we have a worker that could take their Bible and show you how you can know you're on your way to heaven, how you can truly believe, truly be saved. Heavenly Father, I pray you'll bless the invitation. Thank you for the message in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet as the music plays. If you'd like to use the altar, if you need to come, say, Lord, help me to live for you because I am saved. Lord, help me to live for you the way I should because I appreciate, I am thankful, I, I, I love you, Lord. We can never truly repay the Lord for all that he's done, but you know, we can try. I can never truly repay him. But I can say, Lord, here's my life. Lord, I want to give my life to you. How about it? If you're here this morning, you've never truly trusted Christ, never been born again. Being born again is believing, receiving, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. It's that simple. But you can know you have it. You know how many times I ask people, I ask people all the time. You can look up here for a moment while the piano plays softly. You know how many people I, I ask on a, on a weekly basis, do you know for sure if you were to die, you go to heaven? And they say, well, no one can be sure. How many have had people tell you that? No one can really be 100% sure. You know, I have asked Catholic priests that, Jewish rabbis that. I have asked about every religious person that I've ever met, if you know for sure, would you go to heaven? And, and all of them will say, you can't be sure. I hope I go to heaven. I'm trying to get to heaven. But you can't really be sure. Well, the Bible says you can that's a wonderful thing about believing in eternal security. You've got assurance. Amen. Tremendous message. That was important for us. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. And thank you for the uh, Pastor Che's message. And Lord, encourage me. And, and Lord, just to hear it over, just, just to, to read the Word of God, just to hear, hear your Word. Tell me once again that I'm in your hand. And you'll never let me go. And I don't deserve to be saved. I don't deserve eternal life. Lord, by your grace and mercy, you've given it to me. And Lord, I, I, and I'm grateful for that. So I want to live for you, Lord. I want to serve you. Help us, Lord, to have that attitude and that spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much.